Okay. Uh, I'm going to turn off, uh, it doesn't look like my picture's on screen, so okay. I'm going to turn off my video to get better bandwidth. Sure. Okay. Um, well, it's uh, good to uh, be with you virtually. Uh, thank you for inviting me to uh, speak. I'd like to kind of give my standard presentation on the status of Embedded Linux. And this is the September uh, 2013 update of that talk. Um, so next slide. So we'll go through uh, kind of a standard list. I'll talk about the different kernel versions, uh, some of the major technology areas, uh, CE workgroup projects, um, and uh, then just get to some other kind of community-related stuff, industry stuff, and uh, point to some resource. So next slide. Let's start with kernel versions. So uh, let's look at the kernel versions in the last year. Uh, so last year in September, uh, Linux version 3.6 was announced, and um, we are actually pretty much staying with a pretty consistent schedule. Doing, doing one about every two and a half months. Uh, so we have September and December and February. And then actually it's interesting that kernels have actually started to get a little bit faster starting in April and then June. And just for fun, I predicted uh, that it would be on July 7th, at the 3.10 release. And it actually uh, appeared in uh, 30th of June. I was seven days off, which is actually the farthest I've been off so far. Uh, and then since the last uh, Jamboree, we've actually had uh, actually those, both those releases, so 3.10 and 3.11, both pretty short releases, uh, getting down closer to just two months. So we are actually currently at 3.11. Uh, we're in the merge window for 3.12. It's still open. Um, we're not in the uh, release candidate series yet. Uh, so my prediction is, I don't think we're going to stay at this same rate. Um, next slide, I predict that our next uh, kernel release will be the 8th of November, which is about 68 days. So we'll have to see, uh, I kind of split the difference. We'll see if we have the same kind of, if we keep having a short release, uh, or if we kind of go back to the longer releases. The thing that's interesting about this one is that LinuxCon is happening uh, actually this week, uh, and uh, then at the end, that's at the beginning of this, during the merge window, and then at the end of the merge window, or at the end of the release cycle, we'll have the kernel summit, which will be uh, in Scotland in October. So it'll be nice to see what happens, but that's kind of my predictions. So just real quickly, I want to talk, uh, I've, I've gone over some of this stuff before, so if you've been to uh, one of these meetings in the Jamboree, uh, I apologize that I'm repeating, but we do actually have two new kernel versions to cover, so uh, we have kind of more material on the kernel versions than usual for Jamboree. In Linux 3.6, uh, some of the major features related to embedded uh, we have the Android RAM console functionality was integrated in the P Store. Uh, this is a feature that uh, allows you to go back and look at uh, dumps of the kernel messages uh, that are saved into a persistent storage place. So it's pretty handy for debugging. Uh, the other thing is we had some updates to the CAN protocol, uh, an extension to uh, CAN. This is interesting for automotive. Can with flexible database, data rate. Uh, we had some stuff about L LED one shot mode, uh, and this actually uh, is useful, uh, often used, well, obviously for LEDs, but also for things like vibrators. Uh, you can do kind of timed, one time LED and GPIO manipulations. Um, and then suspend to both, uh, which is a way to create a resume image both in RAM and on disk so that if the power dies during suspend, the disk image can be used to resume. So kind of a fail-safe uh, backup mechanism for suspending a machine. In Linux 3.7, uh, we started to see the first bits of ARM multi-platform support. 
Uh, and throughout my presentation, I have links to LWN.net articles. That's where I get a lot of my material from. Uh, so you can go look at that for details. But we're actually starting to see kernels that can support multiple ARM platforms at the same time. It's a little bit weird. The kernel has always supported this on x86. There's been kind of a, you could build a kernel and it would run on lots of different x86 platforms because there was a lot of standardization in the desktop industry. Uh, but that standardization is very much missing in ARM. Uh, but we're starting to see that coming out. And this, this, is, a, this is a nice feature. Uh, we also saw the 64-bit support go into uh, 3.7. Uh, it seems like it's been there a long time, but it's just been in the last year. Uh, also, there's been a lot of interest in terms of cryptographically signed kernel modules. So a security feature, uh, which is uh, actually used very heavily uh, for some of the, uh, the platforms. Uh, I think phones are using this. Um, and then uh, perf trace uh, is, a, is an alternative to S trace. And, and uh, the nice thing is it allows intermingling kernel trace events with syscall events. Um, I used to have uh, my own private system to do this type of intermingling. It's very, very useful to see what's going on in the kernel. Uh, and at the same time, uh, how that relates to the events that are coming in from uh, user space in terms of syscalls. Uh, and so a new, a new feature added to perf. Uh, the other thing is there's a lot of runtime power management added for audio. Uh, in general, we're seeing a lot of uh, device power management or subsystem power management going into the kernel because there's so much interest in uh, mobile devices and handheld devices. And then just kind of an interesting uh, little feature, the kernel doc system can now output in HTML5 format. So that's kind of nice to generate the docs uh, and make them accessible. You can view them with any web browser. In Linux 3.8, we saw the introduction of the uh, F2FS, Flash-Friendly File System. Um, and I'll, I'll talk, actually have a slide on this uh, later when I talk about technologies. Uh, so I won't talk about it now. There's a thermal, uh, thermal governor system. So besides just power, in terms of managing the power for battery life, there's also management of the power uh, to, to uh, be careful of not overheating the machines to control the, the, the temperature of the machine. And so besides things like uh, uh, frequency governors, uh, we're seeing thermal governors as well. Uh, also, uh, we saw some memory control group support uh, for accounting for kernel memory usage. Uh, so what this in, uh, consisted of was uh, uh, accounting and limits for watching the kernel stack and uh, the slab that was used by different processes. You could put them in different control groups and, and do some accounting and, and set some quotas for things. So this is pretty. This is pretty interesting. This is something uh, that took over the course of many years. We've taken lots of different approaches to try and. Um, manage and monitor uh, kernel usage. And uh, so this is the latest attempt related to uh, control groups. And then we also saw in this release, Linux 3.8, we saw CPU idle support for big.little. And that's another topic uh, that uh, I'll talk quite a bit about. Uh, the relationship between uh, big.little, we actually see hardware designs uh, that are specifically designed for uh, power saving uh, and kind of new heterogeneous styles of designs for that. Uh, I'll talk. I'll talk more about that later. Then uh, next slide with 3.9, we saw a um, couple of miscellaneous things uh, again having to do with tracing. Uh, F trace got the capability to be able to take a snapshot, um, and in this regard, it was kind of catching up. To something that LTPNG had had for many years, which was uh, called uh, in-flight mode. Uh, but this is, you can grab a snapshot of a running trace without having to stop the trace. Um, and uh, so that's a, that's a nice new feature for, for tracing. Also, uh, we're starting to see virtualization. 
uh, for uh, ARM processors. Uh, I'm not a big fan of virtualization in the embedded space, but uh, people have been taught, telling me that there's some uses for it, uh, particularly when uh, adding mobile devices in, uh, in a business setting. Uh, there's some extra security issues that can be handled with virtualization. Um, but uh, so we're starting to see that show up for ARM. Uh, and then PowerPC support for transactional memory. And this is the very first, uh, very first sign that I've seen of the kernel having support for transactional memory. Um, right now, I think this is heavily geared towards uh, high-end server-style uh, operations, but it'll be interesting to see what happens with this in the future. In terms of just kind of configuring the kernel, uh, there was an option, long-time option, called Config Experimental. Um, and that has now been configured just uh, to be on permanently and uh, should actually be removed. Um, and also having to do with kernel configuration, make menu config for years and years, the only way to save a menu config was when you exited. And you can now actually just save a snap snapshot. So there's now save and load buttons uh, in make menu config. So that's pretty handy. And you can save them off to a different file name, I believe. Uh, so that's something to look forward to when you switch to that kernel. Um, and then another thing coming up in uh, the that was put into the 3.9 kernel was descriptor-based GPIO. So uh, we've had a GPIO system in the kernel, uh, and the current framework or the framework before 3.9 uh, used a number, um, and you can still use numbers, but uh, you can use the old number-based. GPIO uh, operations, but using a descriptor is a little bit um, is better in terms of uh, robustness of the program. So you can't mistakenly hand in a number that you for a GPIO uh, that you have not requested and properly set up. Uh, if you've got a descriptor, the descriptor is kind of a unique, opaque handle, uh, and so this this is uh, an improvement over the old number-based system. <clears throat> it also added some features along the way, uh, so it allowed you to group GPIOs uh, together to perform operations uh, on a set of GPIOs atomically. Uh, this could be possibly useful for handling real-time issues or for, uh, for avoiding race conditions uh, when you're trying to manipulate multiple pieces of external hardware at once. And there's an article on LWN.net about that. So, next slide. So, in 3.10, uh, we saw actually quite a bit of stuff. Uh, there was full tick lists. Uh, I'll talk, uh, I have a whole slide on that later. Uh, but we're seeing a lot more support for single Z image. Um, and uh, so, a lot of platforms. Can be you can build a kernel that will run on lots of different platforms, or at least platforms in the same kind of uh, SOC families. Um, I don't I don't think you can build a single kernel that will run on uh, all kinds of different ARM platforms, but at least within a within a, a family of CPUs or a family of SOCs. Um, Ar Arn Bergman said he was shooting for almost complete coverage by version 3.12. I don't think we've quite made it. I think there's still a little bit of work to go, but uh, in 3.10, uh, which was released, I, I think around the, this was in the April time frame, if I recall correctly, then that, this is, uh, things, were, things were pretty good. The other thing is multi-cluster power management, and uh, this was partial support for big.lil, and when I talk about power management and power work scheduling, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about this. So next slide. Uh, let's see. Oh, the other, a couple other things. Uh, again, with ftrace, uh, there are now multiple ftrace buffers, so you can have multiple uh, tracing. Uh, well, traces being done simultaneously. Used to be there was only a single ring buffer or set of ring buffers for tracing uh, for ftrace, and so only one uh, one trace could be set up at a time. And now there are multiple trace buffers, so you can have a trace running that's like watching scheduling. At the same time, you could also have a trace watching syscalls or a particular subsystem 
Uh, so it's much more flexible. Um, and uh, you do have to kind of watch the interactions, the performance interactions. Uh, tracing always adds some overhead. Uh, and so you have to be careful if you're running multiple of them at the same time uh, that you don't cause uh, too much performance degradation. But uh, the other thing is uh, a memory memory pressure control group support. So um, the, the thing that came out in the previous kernel release that had to do with uh, memory and control group was actually accounting and hard limits. Um, and this uh, feature allows you to set thresholds uh, for particular groups and allows you to get notifications if memory is getting low. So you can implement your own uh, out of memory handler, or it's, it's not an out of memory handler, it's a, a memory low handler uh, in user space. And you can do things uh, like uh, release memory back to the system or other, other things to avoid having processes get killed by the kernel. Uh, so this is actually a pretty nice feature for embedded products. Uh, next slide. Uh, and then uh, I want to get back to this one. This is the uh, full tick list, uh, uh, also called the full dynamic tick. Uh, so uh, under some conditions, so currently, well, before, before this feature, uh, there were uh, periodic ticks and there have been a lot of efforts to reduce the uh, reduce the, um, the the periodic tick on um, on all processors, or to to go to idle as often as, as possible. But it's now possible to kind of configure the system so that in certain circumstances, uh, some processors run with no periodic ticks at all. Um, so. Uh, there was an option previously that was called uh, config no hertz uh, that used the dynamic tick, but that that would only turn off the ticks when the CPU was idle. Uh, so the difference with this is that you can have a CPU that is running at full speed, that's not in the idle state, and still have uh, actually no periodic ticks coming in. Um, so the only restriction on this uh, is that uh, the boot CPU, the, the kind of the main CPU that is uh, the one that the system initially boots up on, usually CPU zero, cannot be full tickless. Um, and uh, in any CPU cannot be full tickless with, when it's got more than one process. But this does uh, present the option to have um, some workloads that that can run uh, uninterrupted by any uh, ticks, and uh, when when those uh, e either and when those uh, processes go idle, you get the benefit of uh, no wake ups on that. So it's a power saving uh, when you're dealing with the idle case, and it's also a performance enhancement when you're when you're dealing with standalone processes. So this is a pretty neat feature, uh, very interesting. And you'll see in the next release of the kernel, there's some things that build on top of this uh, to even improve the power management. OK. So now, getting into some new stuff. Uh, so some of the things that came out in the 3.11 kernel, which was released in June, uh, were power efficient work queues. Uh, this is a feature uh, currently uh, when you uh, put a job into a work queue in the kernel, um, it's basically just run on the processor that uh, that is uh, that work queue was running on previously, um, but this allows the work to be done on any CPU, uh, and what that does is essentially kind of a form of uh, migration, but it's kind of automatic in the work queue system. Um, this allows the work to be since it can be done on any CPU, uh, you can take a running CPU and have it process items in a work queue uh, to avoid waking up a sleeping CPU. So the work from where the, the, the CPU is scheduled to work does not have to be the CPU that actually executes the work. Um, and so that's more power efficient. There's a lot of work going into uh, avoiding <coughs> having uh, waking up CPUs unnecessarily. Um, so there's a lot of there's a lot of work been going on uh, to support uh, 
uh, much better power management in the kernel. Uh, also in this release, we have the LZ4 kernel image compression. Um, and so it's uh, another dot on the spectrum. It's not the most efficient compression, but it gives you an option to balance compression versus uh, speed, uh, boot time speed. Um, so it's another option that's available. And then uh, one thing I thought was interesting is there's a, there's a program in the kernel called Check Patch, which uh, when you're submitting patches to mainline, uh, it reports errors or issues that you need to work on. Um, and there's now actually an option to it. Uh, it looks like a solid line there. That's supposed to be two dashes, dash, dash, fix. Um, and what will happen is if you use the dash, dash, fix option, Checkpack will actually uh, attempt to fix some of the simple errors that you might have. So instead of having to just look at the report and go fix them yourself, you can now uh, have Checkpack automatically fix some of the errors that uh, are in patches. And then also in 3.11, uh, F2FS uh, is continuing to mature. Uh, there were a lot of patches uh, in this release from Samsung to continue to remain. Yeah. Let's see. I think it's big. It's big. This is a patch set that's been see, out of the green Unfortunately, yep. the line a little bit, you know, uh, interrupted. So, that, could you please uh, repeat from the uh, portion of Samsung? Okay. Yes. Uh, let's see. So, uh, basically, uh, in 3.11, there were <coughs> lots of patches uh, to enhance F2FS. Uh, so, it's continuing to uh, become a mature file system. And I'll talk a little bit more about that when I when I go over file systems. Uh, next slide. Now, a very interesting feature. I think this is one of the most exciting features. I I think it's very interesting is ZSwap. Uh, I may have talked about this before, but this is a, a compressed cache uh, for swap pages, um, and it looks at the pages that are in the process of being swapped out, and uh, tries to compress them into a dynamically allocated RAM-based memory pool. It's very often the case that we do not use swap uh, in embedded systems uh, because, um, because of the overhead of swap. But this actually uh, offers a, a possibility of something that could be useful for products um, by having a RAM-based swap uh, or a compressed RAM-based swap, and it, you can have a uh, much less I.O. Uh, input-output, and uh, you can have performance gains for systems that get into a swapping situation. Um, especially when uh, we're dealing with NAND flash as the backing store for swap, uh, this, is, this is pretty interesting, uh, a way to uh, help performance. Most of the time embedded, we, we don't have swaps, but this, this might change that. Uh, so I hope people play around with this and experiment with, uh, with how this works on actual products. Um, so we are now in the 3.12 uh, uh, merge window as we speak. Uh, it's still open. It will probably go on for well, it'll probably end this week. Probably end uh, maybe tomorrow or Saturday. <clears throat> so most of what uh, is likely to go into 3.12 has already been submitted to Linus. There was an interesting little hiccup. Linus had a hard drive crash. Um, his uh, solid state drive crashed uh, a couple days ago, but he did not lose a whole lot of data. I think he lost about a half day's worth of data. But uh, he's just pulling from a bunch of trees, so he re requested that everyone uh, send him, resend him the pull request so he could make sure he got everything. Um, which is pretty amazing when you think about it, that you can have a hard drive crash and it doesn't really affect your workflow that much. <clears throat> so in 3.12, some of the things we'll see is uh, we'll see full system idle detection. Uh, so this is a kind of a tricky thing, but basically um, 
it allows the, the system to detect when all of the CPUs in the system have gone idle. Um, and it's, uh, you want to do that without a lot of overhead. If you, if you spend too much time checking for those conditions, uh, you don't save any power. Uh, but uh, uh, Paul McKinney, who, who is uh, the author of RCU, Free Copy Update Mechanism, uh, came up with a kind of a tricky way to uh, allow for individual CPUs to report their idleness and using a per CPU variable, uh, while at the same time uh, allowing a fast detection of global CPU idleness. And the main idea here is that if you know that all systems are asleep, then you can actually take the machine into a deeper, uh, deeper suspend state. Um, and uh, so that's, that's, again, it's a power saving thing. Uh, also, uh, there's a new CPU idle driver uh, that is built on, uh, well, that builds on the multi-cluster power management. So uh, I would not say that big dot little CPU scheduling is in kernel yet, but it's getting closer. Um, and so that, that's a new, kind of a neat new uh, scheduling feature that we'd like to see uh, in the kernel. And then uh, a lot of drive, device drivers are converting over to device tree. And device tree has become a really, really big topic. There's lots of contentious issues uh, I'm gonna. I have a whole set of slides that'll talk about that. Uh, let's see. Next slide. Okay. So this is my list of things to watch. Um, and uh, so these are just things that I think are going to be interesting in the future. Things that are not in uh, all, or at least all the way in the kernel yet. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of people working on these and making progress. So in terms of Android features, there's uh, two things related to memory, which is volatile ranges, and uh, the other one is the ion memory allocator, and I'll talk about both of those later. Um, the other one is big, big dot little multiprocessor scheduling, um, and uh, there's the in-kernel switcher work having to do with that, so some scheduling things for uh, performance for heterogeneous processors. Uh, I already talked about the single Z image support on ARM. That's something to watch. We'll continue to see more work being done on that. Uh, so someday in the future, maybe we'll have a single kernel we can run on lots of different ARM machines. I don't know if it'll ever happen. I mean, it, it's clearly desirable in the in kind of the uh, I don't know if I'd call it the desktop space, but kind of laptop or netbook space. I don't know about tablets and phones, but we'll have to see. And then support for, for transactional memory instructions. And this could be as big a deal in the long run as locking primitives. A uh, very different way to approach how to synchronize um, operations in multiprocessor systems. If we can push that down into hardware, we can get rid of a lot of locking. And, uh, and really increase the robustness of the kernel. Uh, so it will be interesting to watch that. Uh, and then kind of uh, related to this lot longer term is non-volatile mass memory. And uh, last year at Linux, LinuxCon, Linus uh, talked about this. Um, and uh, he was kind of skeptical that it will happen this year. Uh, so a year has gone by, and I think he was right, it didn't happen this year. Uh, his, uh, his idea was that this will not change a lot of kernel algorithms. Uh, this, uh, basically what will happen is we'll start to see some of the changes for this creep into file systems. Uh, and byte addressable storage as opposed to block addressable storage really has some big implications for uh, long-term storage and how we interact with the file systems. We've been dealing with block-based file systems for so long that it will be a hard transition. I think it will be difficult to uh, kind of start to deal with this and see what the effects are uh, throughout the file system stack. Uh, I think applications will uh, still segregate data between persistent and non-persistent uh, categories. And this is a change that will take a long, a long time. But I think it is coming. 
I think non-volatile mass memory, things like phase change memory or uh, MRAM, they are they are coming, and it should have a really big impact on. Uh, well, it'll have some impact on uh, power management. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> so that's stuff to watch in the future. So technology areas. Now that we've next, next slide. Yeah. So now we'll talk about technology areas. Uh, the first time, the first one is boot up time. And uh, I feel bad because I said this, the same thing last time uh, in June. I said, well, there's not much new stuff to watch this time. It doesn't seem to be a whole lot of work on this. Uh, there is stuff to watch out for. Uh, we need to be really careful. I'm very worried about device tree. So one of the features that went into 3.12 or is on its way into 3.12 uh, was sending the device tree into the random number pool. And this was not, there's not that much unique data in a device tree. And, uh, and so you don't get very much uh, random uh, entropy out of it. Uh, and it's, uh, I don't know how long it's going to take. On other platforms, they said, well, it's only a couple hundred uh, microseconds. Like, but I could easily see this, especially as device tree files get bigger, taking five or ten milliseconds, and that's just a waste of time because there's not enough entropy to justify that cost. But we'll see. We just need to always stay vigilant, uh, always watch out for uh, things that are taking up overhead on boot time. There's also the device tree parsing. So I'm not a, for boot time, I think device tree is a real problem. Uh, but there, I have nothing new to report here. Uh, next slide. In terms of gra graphics, I also don't have a whole lot new to report. The big news in the desktop realm is uh, Mir versus Wayland as the successor to X. Uh, what Mir is basically being used by Ubuntu is kind of more of an X extension. Wayland is kind of a newer architecture. It's being pushed by almost everyone else. Both both are successors to X. I don't think uh, the issues have not really crept down into the embedded space yet on these, because uh, uh, most of the issues they're talking about are fairly uh, for very big, big things like multi-monitor systems and remote graphics, and a lot of those options are not really being done. Although you are seeing a lot of casting these days, uh, project taking the screen and putting it on other devices in the mobile space. Uh, but Android is kind of using the same thing stuff it's been using: Skia, OpenGL, ES, Surface Slinger. Uh, other embedded devices that are not Android are still using kind of the standard things we've been using for years, X, uh, FBDev, QT, PTK on top of Cairo. Uh, one thing that happened the last year was QT was sold by Nokia. It had it originally been at Trolltech, and uh, Nokia acquired them when they were doing a lot of Linux, and uh, they finally, well, not, not super recently, but in the last year it got sold to Didia. So it's, we'll have to see what happens with QT, if it kind of continues to be relevant and embedded. Um, and then the, there's uh, one issue that there is going on uh, is kernel mode setting in the kernel. Um, and uh, this is, allows the kernel to control the graphics modes. Uh, this is good for preventing race conditions. It also is good because we never have solved the problem of uh, proprietary uh, graphics drivers. And so for things like suspend and resume, it's always a little bit dicey uh, when the graphics modes are handled up in user space. Um, uh, and so uh, this kernel mode setting is uh, is is good in the regard that we can turn some of that important stuff that needs to be handled uh, very quickly for the suspend and resume paths uh, in, into the kernel. Uh, and there's talk about, at the last Lenaro conference, there was talk about maybe switching the hardware composer, which is uh, a layer that um, uh, kind of the equivalent of surface layer uh, puts, puts uh, things together, moving that from F FBDEV to your kernel mode switch. Or both things. Anyway, so that's kind of what's going on in the graphics front. Uh, next thing is file systems. And uh, 
there's really kind of uh, two file systems and then the five file system tuning guide I want to talk about here. So F2FS, uh, this is a flash friendly file system. I already mentioned it was mainline in Linux version 3.8. Uh, this is a log structured file system uh, with lots and lots of tweaks very specific to uh, NAND flash storage. Uh, it's got some pretty interesting ideas. It's got um, a data separation between hot data and cold data. Uh, so it's specifically geared to the way that current flash memories in uh, MMC and SD, uh, the way that they manipulate the box the blocks on the disk and the way they garbage collect. So it, it may turn out to be too specific. Um, it, there does it does require some tuning in order to match it to the characteristics of the flash device. Uh, but it's it does show significant performance benefits. And uh, there have been talks about this at ELC uh, and ELC Europe last year. Um, and so this is something that's good to watch. This was written by Samsung. Uh, the good thing is they continue to enhance it. Uh, just in 3.12, uh, there was additional support for uh, support for security attributes. So you could do things like store uh, SE Linux labels or security tags. Uh, I am not sure if anything is actually shipped with this yet. I do not know if it's gone out in a Samsung phone. I would expect Samsung to be the first user of it, but you never know. Uh, if anyone knows, if Samsung has used this in a phone, please let me know, because I would be really interested uh, to see if it's actually seeing commercial exposure in, in uh, real products. Um, I would expect they're getting pretty close to using it. So the next, the next one is uh, the CE Workgroup uh, has produced or funded a Flash File System Tuning Guide. And I did talk about this last uh, time, so I don't need to repeat it, but basically, uh, we paid a contractor to go out and measure uh, the effect of different kernel tuning options. So things like the I.O. scheduler, uh, the flash geometry, and uh, the, the flash part attributes, and with different workloads. And that document is actually available now. So if you want to see what types of options you can configure in the kernel, and how different uh, flash file systems perform different operations, you know, which ones are better at writing, writing re, uh, random writes versus sequential writes, random reads, sequential reads, all that. That's in the document. So that's pretty useful. Hopefully it's useful for people. That's the type of project we did. Um, the next thing that I want to talk about is XFAT. Um, so this was a weird sequence of events. Um, and it's not, so I don't know if you know very much about XFAT, this, this happened over the summer in the last couple months, but the XFAT file system is the file system that's, that's most commonly used on SD cards. So when you get an SD card uh, from the, as a product, just as a, a retail product, this is the file system that will be on it already. Um, but this is a file system that is covered by Microsoft patents. Um, because it's ubiquitous, the, the file system is used everywhere. Uh, it's pretty much a requirement to support it, but this is a problem for Linux uh, because, uh, well, I'll explain in a second. So uh, Samsung had some code that they were using with their version of Linux, um, and they have not published the code, uh, but a, an independent Russian developer uh, went out and uh, kind of liberated the code from Samsung. We don't know how they got the code, but it was clear that it was Samsung code. The license, there was some interesting thing with the license uh, that was not clear that it was being released as GPL. Uh, some code, there were developers who were asserting that some code may have been derived from the kernel, so how could it not be GPL? Anyway, I can just imagine, because I've been in these types of things before, I can just imagine the scrambling that was going on at Samsung to kind of figure this out and figure out how to, uh, uh, to resolve this as an issue. A couple of weeks later, after this initial release was leaked by the Russian developer, Samsung released the code under GPL v2. Uh, so that's, that's good. 
So Samsung has complied with their obligations under the DPL. There is still this issue, however, of, um, of the patent on XFAT. Um, other companies, uh, I will not go into details, but other companies solve the problem of supporting this file system a different way. Um, if it were up to me, I'm not a lawyer, so you should not use this as legal advice. But if it was up to me, I would not use this code. It seems quite legally dangerous to me. Um, anyway, but that was kind of something interesting that happened over the summer. Uh, so be careful with this one. If you need to support XFAT, uh, do it wisely. Um, yeah, in terms of memory management, uh, the really kind of big news is the ION memory allocator. Uh, and uh, talk about that on the next slide here. So the ION memory allocator, this is uh, came from Android, and the kernel currently has uh, an API for sharing memory areas between devices and, and between user space uh, processes. Um, but uh, this is this one has some different attributes that that none of the others have. The other the other two ones are CMA and DMA buff. Uh, but uh, anyway, the ION memory allocator written by uh, Google allows sharing of memory areas between kernel subsystems and it reduces the amount of copies, specifically um, between user space. So a single buffer can be transferred or it can be used by multiple user space uh, components without having to copy the data. But uh, almost all of these buffers are managed by the kernel because they involve some kind of device access. The common example that is given is uh, like a camera wanting to put the, the uh, share a buffer with the screen so that the image data can, go, can land directly into memory that's accessible to the, the graphics processor. Um, and different devices have different memory constraints uh, for various reasons. Some, sometimes the memory has to be contiguous, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, sometimes the memory should be cached, and sometimes it should not be. And so, uh, because different devices have different constraints, ION can actually select memory areas from system memory uh, that, have, uh, that match the constraints of the clients that it will be using a particular uh, memory buffer. Uh, the other thing that ION can do is it can manage the cache relationship. Uh, caching is pretty tricky on some of these buffers. Uh, you have to make sure that um, when pro separate processes are synchronizing their access to the buffers, that you're not losing data uh, because it's cached in one place and it hasn't been flushed through the buffer. Uh, but ION it has the capability to manage that cache relationship or leave the management up to the into other processes. The only problem is this is not likely to go upstream in its current form. Uh, ION uses some ARM specific page accessors, uh, so it's very, right now it only works on ARM 32 bit, does not work on uh, ARM 64, and does not work on x86 or, or in other processors. Uh, and it also allows some very, very hardware specific optimization. Uh, and, so like one of the examples I saw was it uh, allows you to specify like a particular uh, memory module uh, SIM that you know you can add extensions to ION that allow you to get that specific about you know I want this buffer to land in this particular memory chip or this particular memory module um, and so some of those are very very um, platform dependent. And so it may have some difficulty getting mainline, but it is, it, it solves some real problems with graphics performance uh, on Android platforms. And so uh, I think there's a lot of interest in what it's doing and trying to get that integrated into uh, Linux somehow. Uh, next slide. Okay, so the big thing in, in power management uh, is uh, power aware scheduling. There's kind of two, two things that are going on here. Uh, it was kind of general purpose power wear scheduling. And the, the main theme here is to see how fast you can get as many CPUs as possible go idle. 
So you have small task packing, which is uh, a feature that um, where the, the system is looking for small tasks that only have a little bit of time, or only using up a little bit of time, and seeing if it can take those off of almost idle CPU. So if you see the CPU that only has one small task on it, can it migrate that task over to a CPU that may be more busy, but if you add that to it, it just, it just uh, basically fills up that, the, the busy CPU while letting the other CPU go idle. So it's kind of basically load balancing, but with an attempt to get as many CPUs idle as possible. And then the same thing, there's task placement on mixed CPU power systems. And this is really, mixed CPU power systems really means uh, big dot little. So heterogeneous, so you have processors that are capable of small amount, or kind of lower power, and by power I mean um, lower performance, uh, lower throughput in terms of computational power, or high computational power. Um, and so th this does the opposite. This looks at large tasks and tries to move large tasks to faster CPUs so that the, once again, the full system can go, as many processors as possible can go to idle as, as fast as possible. There's some really good uh, resources on LWN.net talking about this. There's an overview article uh, and also some resistance. People talking about, uh, in particular, Ingo Molnar uh, would like to see a lot of this stuff. Instead of coming in with little bits that uh, stepwise, he'd like to and spread out over multiple systems, he would like to see that consolidated into the scheduler. And there's, so there's a lot of discussion. It'll take a while for this stuff to drop out. And we're, we've already seen that. So next slide. Um, this is all part of big dot little scheduling, um, or it's big dot little scheduling is related to this. Uh, you're seeing multi-cluster power scheduling um, and what's known as the n-kernel switcher. And there actually was a really good talk at LinuxCon Japan by Nakagawa-san of Rinasas, um, talking about uh, their particular implementation of some extra scheduling tweaks uh, for a big dot little system. Uh, we're still waiting to see how this uh, kind of works in real products. Um, and so uh, we have stuff from the lab, but I don't know if anybody has actually shipped this out commercially yet. It's in pretty new kernels, and so a lot of this stuff has not made its way into uh, kind of mass, mass products yet. Uh, next slide. Okay, system side, system size, and this this I actually talked about uh, quite a bit the last time, but I'll so I'll go through it kind of quickly. But um, uh, in terms of kernel size, uh, the big the big thing here is cooperative memory relinquishment, and by that uh, what that means is when processes communicate to with each other and with the system to voluntarily release their memory uh, when you get memory pressure. Uh, the big thing here is volatile ranges, and that's basically being developed uh, to support uh, some systems that Android had. Um, uh, what was it? I think it was, was it PMEM or HashMem or something like that. I think it was HashMem that this is replacing. And then there was some Lexmark work uh, that they talked about, uh, system-wide memory management without swap at ELC 2013. And they actually had a broker and a way for processes to communicate and release memory when they needed to to the system. Uh, I think uh, this is pretty interesting stuff. Uh, next slide. So the other thing is uh, library reduction. You see a lot of people trying different libraries to see what the effect is. Trying to, if they're really concerned about size, they'll be switching to one of these smaller libraries. And particularly, um, I think it's interesting to look at the Bionic library. So the Bionic is not Ovix compliant. Uh, it's the library from Android. Uh, but you can see that it's quite a bit sm smaller than glibc. So if you're really interested in and it's almost, probably, uh, well, it's a little bit more than half, but it's uh, smaller, quite a bit smaller than uglibc as well, which has uh, always been kind of a, one of the smaller libraries. And, the, and then also you see, um, the ability to configure parts of libc. So if you really, really want to stick with uh, 
full-blown LibC, but you're willing to uh, carve some parts of it out, you can also get some size savings. And so there are ELC talks on both of those techniques. Uh, next slide. The other, <clears throat> the other person talking about size is me, it turns out. Um, I had this uh, advanced size optimization of Linux kernel talk I gave at LinuxCon uh, Japan. Um, and I had a project that I was working on uh, uh, at Sony to find automated ways to reduce the kernel. Uh, that include link time optimization, system call elimination, uh, command line argument elimination, and a, and a constraint system. Uh, and so I was actually just asked about this recently. Uh, how come I haven't mainlined any of this? And basically, almost all my work depends on link time optimization. And so there's a set of patches by Andy Queen uh, that need to get mainlined before uh, before my stuff can get mainlined. Um, so there is a lot of additional research uh, that I referred to uh, called link time rewriting and cold code compression. If you're interested in this topic, uh, I recommend you go out and look at the wiki. I have my slides from LinuxCon Japan out there. Uh, so there's still I still am interested, kind of from a hobby perspective, uh, in in small systems. So uh, I switched from uh, my job at, uh, at Sony and Sony Network Entertainment yeah. into Sony Mobile uh, recently. And so Sony Mobile uh, is not quite so concerned about the kernel size anymore. The, the phones we're shipping now have, have two gig of RAM and so uh, we're not sweating 4K in the kernel. Uh, but I still think this is a real need for a small embedded. So it was interesting to see uh, Intel announce the Quark processor. Uh, so they're actually going to lower uh, lower end machines, trying to hit the Internet of Things and, and compete with the Cortex-M. Uh, so I think the size reduction is still interesting to people. Uh, but not so much me and my job. Uh, then security. So in, in security, really in the embedded space, uh, I see people deploying both SMAC and SE Linux. Uh, you have SMAC uh, for Tizen. So I think in automotive, they're kind of looking at Tizen. And uh, people have uh, come up with a simplified rule set with uh, three tiers and about 40,000 rules. Uh, so to kind of make it create a secure system. Security in, in automobiles is actually pretty important, uh, especially as the buses there are not really secure themselves. Uh, so you really want to try and uh, make sure that the operating systems are as secure as possible, even if it only looks like they're on the infotainment side. Uh, you want to be really careful with that. Uh, but in Android, next slide. In Android, uh, really Android is looks like they're uh, going towards uh, SE Linux. Um, I, I talked about this for a long time. SE Linux was previously way too big for embedded. Uh, I remember some of the very early attempts at uh, SE Linux required about 200 or 2 meg. That was just the overhead. That was not the full kernel. But the overhead is 2 meg, and and a desktop uh, SE uh, rule set is about 900,000 rules. That's crazy. Uh, but I have seen reports of an SE Android policy that only has um, uh, 1,658 rules and 263 types, only 71K. That is an acceptable overhead for security in the embedded space. And uh, I think this is now the default. Uh, I think this is turned on in, um, for example, 4.3 of Android. Um, let's see, next slide. In the area of tracing, we have KTAP, uh, which was, um, these are some uh, patches that are out of the tree, but basically the way, a way to do dynamic tracing uh, without the overhead of compiling into a module, which is uh, what system tap does. Uh, and this actually adds an interpreter to the kernel. Um, it's a single leverage, single module that you can load into the kernel that leverages ftrace, kprobe, et cetera and it produces results in ASCII, uh, does not use the green buffer system in the kernel. But pretty nice system. I, I can see this becoming uh, interesting for people to be able to in-field produce new types of tracing systems. 
or the kernel in a very easy way. Okay, so uh, device tree. What can I say about device tree? Um, it is taking over, it's completely taking over uh, in the ARM space. The, basically, there are new requirements for implementing ARM board support and drivers. Uh, you pretty much have to use device tree. Uh, device tree itself is, I, I'm not going to go into all the technical details of device tree, but it's a mechanism for separating the hardware description from the code. And there are reasons why that is useful, particularly to create a single, single Z image that can run on multiple platforms. That's pretty much a requirement that you have that separation. Uh, so you can use device tree instead of the old platform data in your drivers to, to customize those drivers for whatever platform you're on. I have been working with it a lot lately. I have found it very complicated to use. Um, it's not mature yet. The SOC vendors are still rolling support for this out. There's a lot of confusion. It's not mature. There's areas like DMA and pin control where this is still being developed. They don't know what the bindings should be. The binding is kind of the description of what things you put in the device tree, which is a, a ASCII text file describing the machine, versus what you still keep in your driver, which is the kernel code. Everyone out there is working on this. They're required to, uh, to do new board support. Everyone's defining their own bindings. People can't even agree on the names for things what types of attributes should be in the different nodes. Uh, there's not enough documentation. The examples are contradictory because it's not mature yet. People are looking at stuff and they can't tell what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, it's got some downsides. There's no type checking. There's no compile time optimization of the device tree stuff. And so there's you get a lot of silent errors, at least I do. Maybe I'm just a bad coder. But uh, it's really hard to work with. Um, next slide. So uh, what we're going to see is we're going to see a lot of effort to fix all those problems. So there was just recently a change in maintainership. Uh, Grant Likely was kind of the original, uh, well, he has been the maintainer of, of device tree, especially for ARM. Uh, he started in the PowerPC world, and he kind of convinced people to adopt it in the ARM space. Uh, but he's been doing it for many years, uh, almost five years now, I think. And uh, I think he's a, I wouldn't say he's burned out, but he kind of felt like it was time to hand the reins over to other people. He has a consulting business and he needed a little bit extra time. A uh, big problem is there's not enough review of bindings. So as people are creating device tree entries, they're not, um, people are, because of all the confusion and the immaturity, people, the maintainers who have to review these things don't feel like they know enough about it to uh, make good decisions. Uh, there's also been a lot of discussion on the kernel mailing list about the fact that device tree, uh, whether it should be a long-lived ABI to the kernel, which is scaring a lot of people. Uh, one thing about device tree is because it's a should be an operating system neutral description of the hardware, so the device tree should be information should be usable by other operating systems. They've actually been talking about possibly because of that moving the device tree information out of the kernel repository. Personally, I think that would be a disaster. It's hard enough to write your driver when you have the device tree in the same source tree. Uh, it'll be super hard if you have to be looking at two different trees and syncing their releases and stuff. I just think, I think they're crazy if they do that right now. I think maybe in the future, but not right now. Um, but there will be lots of discussion of this at the ARM Summit. So. Uh, you can see, I put a, a couple links on the elinux.org. Uh, there are, this was almost, uh, we, got, we had a ton of presentation proposals for ELC Europe. So there'll be a lot of information after October. There'll be lots of presentations online, hopefully videos, uh, explaining this stuff. And uh, we'll see if we can get this fixed up so that more people know how to do this. Okay, work group projects. So let's talk about self work group projects. So we kind of saw a little bit in 2013. The big thing that we did accomplish this year was um, the EMMC tuning guide. Uh, we had some budget issues that we now have resolved. 
And so we are just recently opened the open project proposal period. So let me talk about both those things. So the EMT tuning guide, I kind of talked about this before. This project analyzed EXT4, uh, ButterFS, and F2FS on a whole bunch of different flash, uh, flash parts and different development boards. And uh, we came up with a document that talks about best practices for tuning Linux uh, file systems for block-based flash file systems. It was just completed, well, just as, uh, I think it was in June, May or June it was completed, and you can go find that online. Hopefully that's useful. Uh, the next slide. So our open project proposals, uh, our proposal period is now open. What this is, is uh, self, uh, the CE work group has money that we would like to spend to improve Linux. And we are looking for uh, ideas for uh, projects to fund. Um, so we have members of the uh, CE work group uh, can propose ideas, but we also uh, take ideas from the general public. We don't fund every idea that comes in, obviously. This is just proposals. Uh, but if you have an idea, if you see a need for something that uh, you think would benefit the industry, benefit Linux as a whole, that for some reason is not being done by other developers or the community, uh, then please propose it. And you do that by sending an email to CELinux-dev, but uh, all the details are on this, on this uh, eLinux wiki page uh, and with the forms for how, how to fill out the form and, and that type of stuff. So please do that. I would like to see your proposal. Uh, we'll be having an AG meeting at the end, an architecture group meeting at the end of October uh, where we will discuss these and, and pick some to fund for the end of this year and the beginning of next year. Uh, other other projects going on, long-term support initiative. I'm not going to talk a whole lot about this because I think Mutakata-san either has already talked about it or is going to talk about it. Yes, Mutakata-san uh, already talked about it. Did he already talk? Yes. Okay. So you can skip my next slide then. Okay. So this is my slide about it. Uh, we can go on to other stuff. Uh, so on other stuff, I just want to talk real quickly about uh, tools, build systems, events, and miscellaneous. Uh, so tools, um, uh, some of the tools I saw at ELC that were pretty interesting was <coughs> a Corda filter called Cortex. Um, and so this was, this was kind of nice, it generates a sparse core dump. I'll let you look at the presentation for that. Uh, also, there was a good set of de the debugging techniques that was uh, presented by Kevin Bankport at ELC. Uh, other than that, some of those perf and ftrace things, really seeing a lot of stuff in tracing. Uh, and the Opto project has been working a lot with some of their um, online tools for uh, building, building distributions online. So you don't have to actually download the build system at all to your machine. Uh, next, next slide is testing frameworks. We're seeing a lot more interesting in, a lot more interest in automatic testing, uh, doing frameworks for, um, for just running all kinds of different testing uh, systems. Uh, there was a really good uh, Birds of a Feather session at, by, done by Matt Porter at ELC. Uh, so if you can find that presentation, that's good. Uh, and then actually we're talking as a CE work group about reviving some test activity. We used to have a test lab. Uh, this would make an excellent uh, project proposal if you have some ideas here, and hopefully we'll talk about this in Scotland. Um, in terms of build systems, kind of the two main ones, uh, that you hear about are the Octo project, which is really kind of based on open embedded. Uh, and there's lots of talks at ELC. There will be some more talks at ELC Europe. And there's uh, lots of tutorials now online. This seems to be, uh, have a lot of momentum. Build Root is still out there and also available as a build system. Not a lot of new information on that, although there will be some, uh, Build Root will also be covered at ELC Europe. Uh, next slide. So in terms of distributions, uh, really, in an embedded space, you've got a lot of different options. So there's Python, uh, which you can take and use. 
the beauty of open source is you, there's all kinds of options. It's really kind of the hard thing is just choosing. You can use Android in, well, traditional Android things like phones, but uh, you can also use it in um, non CE embedded stuff. You can use headless Android, uh, and there's a lot of support there. It's got its own build system. You got the Yafka project, which is kind of a new in house distro, uh, and Angstrom is uh, another open embedded based or, uh, distribution that, that you can use. It's very common to receive this on development boards. I think this is what ships on Beagle Bones. Um, events coming up in, uh, well, LinuxCon in the US is going on this week, I believe. We've got Embedded Linux Conference Europe coming up in uh, end of October, and we'll have some of our CE workgroup meetings there. Uh, and then uh, Embedded Linux Conference 2014, uh, I know it's in April, uh, I think it's towards the end of April in San Jose, so not in February this year. So uh, if you have the travel budget, please join us at one of these. Uh, we would love to see you and uh, we'd love to hear your ideas, what you're doing with uh, Embedded Linux and uh, share some of your uh, results and your research. Uh, next thing is we're still working on the eLinux Wiki. Uh, not a lot of uh, things to report here. The latest project was the video transcription project. If you want to get involved with that, send me an email. Uh, we're trying to get volunteers to transcribe some of the uh, really interesting lectures we've had in the past and to make sure we have uh, those in uh, written in word form besides just the video. Sometimes the videos are hard for people to do because it takes a whole hour if you want to review them. Uh, but so we'd like to transcribe some of those. We're going to have humans do it. Finally, last thing that's been a lot of discussion, a lot of this uh, talk and emails on LKML and on the Kernel Summit discussion list is about kernel community civility. Uh, there was an incident <laughs> over the summer. Uh, Sarah Sharp, well, Linus and Ingo and Greg were talking to each other on the kernel mailing list. And uh, anyway, they were they were saying that maybe people should be harsh to people. And Sarah got Sarah Sharp, uh, who's one of the lead developers in USB, kind of complained, saying, "Well, it's not right to have abusive language, and and uh, and it's not right to kind of turn people off." Uh, so some people say the harshness is needed to maintain quality of the kernel. Uh, other people say the system works okay as it is. Uh, still other people agree with Sarah that things should be improved. Uh, there's a long, long discussion about this, about you know how to uh, how to kind of behave more professionally on the on the main list. I think this will all die down. Uh, this will be discussed at the kernel summit. Uh, maybe. Maybe some documents will be published saying, you know, please keep it nice. Maybe not. not. It'll be interesting to see. But it was a good discussion well, with interesting viewpoints. In the general, the state of our industry is very, very healthy. I uh, used to joke about world domination. I don't anymore because uh, we've basically accomplished it. At least, by my count, at least 1.5 billion devices have shipped with embedded Linux. And many, many, many more uh, will ship in the next few years and on into the future. Linux is basically one in the embedded space, um, and it's still going strong. So it's it's a good time to be an embedded Linux engineer. Uh, last thing I want to do is just point you to some resources. Get most of my information: lwn.net, kernel newbies. Uh, if you want to. If, if you are looking for resources on something, uh, you can do really well if you look at eLinux.org. You go to the events page and look for slides. The slides are not as organized as they could, like by topic, but there's lots and lots of material. If you want to find slides uh, to describe a particular system, the clock framework, pin control, power management, boot up time, tons of slides from all our events over the years are available and many times videos are available as well. Um, and the Linux content Japan slides. The last thing that I want you to do, and this is a personal request to all people who are at this conference, 
at the Jamboree, I'm talking to you right now, is please go to embeddedlinuxconference.com and I would like you to do this before the end of the day and take my survey. So we will be having a game, a closing game. I don't want to reveal any of the details about the game, but I need some survey results. And so I would like everyone in the room, no exceptions, to go and take my survey. It's only about 20 questions. Uh, I timed uh, one of my work colleagues. I made him take the survey, and it only took him about seven minutes. So please, please, please go take my little survey. There's a link on this page, embeddedlinuxconference.com. Um, and we'll have some fun. If you can make it to uh, ELC Europe, then uh, you'll see how it ties in. Uh, but otherwise, I just really appreciate uh, your help putting that survey together. It's for embedded Linux people, so. Uh, and there are no wrong answers. You, it's, it's, you don't be graded on it, so. Anyway, uh, that's it for me. Thank you very much for, uh, for letting me. Okay, thank you very much, Tim. Uh, any questions or comments? Uh, let you know about stuff. Okay, so. sure. Maybe I think uh, you know that uh, there's no uh, marketing link or some of the sales link to the uh, embedded Linux conference, you know, dot com, so that it's quite safe, safe site. So please be encouraged to access it. Okay, any yeah. questions? It may be okay. So anyway, thank you very much, Tim. And uh, maybe see everybody in uh, uh, a lot of people in uh, Edinburgh. Yep. yep. I'm looking forward to it. I do we have a. Uh, I, I just looked at the program. Program I think is uh, is going to be very good, and uh, I think we're getting a lot of people signed up. So. Um, I know, I think a couple of people are there today, well, several of you will be out there, right? So, look forward to seeing everyone. Okay, thank you very much, team. Okay. See you.